Here now is H.M.S. Richards, the voice of prophecy speaker. His subject, Bible Questions. Dear Voice of Prophecy, in view of the terrible confusion man has brought about in this world of ours, what kind of people do you think God would create if he had it to do all over again? Answer, read Acts fifteen eighteen. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the creation. It's not for us to try to determine what God would do or wouldn't do or could do, but what he did... It's written in Genesis 1:26, and God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And that's the way he was made. Anything that has gone wrong with man since is his own fault and not God's. For we read in Ecclesiastes 7:29, God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Man could have been made a mechanical man, an automaton, then God would have been responsible for everything he did. But man was made a free moral agent, and therefore is himself responsible for his own acts. Question, please explain to me why Presbyterians, Methodists, and others use sprinkling for baptism in place of immersion. Well, friends, why not ask these organizations themselves? For a good scriptural passage explaining baptism and its meaning, read the first six or seven verses of the sixth chapter of Romans. Dear Voice of Prophecy, you told us last month, I believe, that you are a Seventh-day Adventist minister. That's right, I did. I'm interested in your teachings and would like to know what you believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the divinity of Christ and his atoning sacrifice for our sins? We suggest that you send for a copy of our broadcast for April 8, 1956, entitled The Deity of Christ. Also the broadcast for April 22, Jesus the Lamb of God. It is our plan to broadcast plain Bible statements. The scriptures, without doubt, plainly and clearly call Jesus God. You'll find that in Hebrews, the first chapter and the eighth verse. The Bible teaches the deity of Christ and we proclaim it gladly and wholeheartedly. Our Savior said, Ye believe in God, believe also in me. John 14, 1. He was with the Father in creation, the first chapter of John, first verse and onward. Thanking God for the birth of our Savior in Bethlehem long ago, we can say with the prophet Isaiah, For unto us a child is born, Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. That's Isaiah 9, 6. Question, why don't you say more about the devil in your sermons? Don't you think he exists? Well, the first reason, no doubt, is that I'm anxious to say more and more about Christ. The second reason is that there isn't time to tell all about the glories of our Savior. His deity, his perfect life, his atoning, sacrificial death, his glorious resurrection, his ascension to heaven, his holy ministry as our mediator in heaven, his second coming in power and glory. There isn't time enough to tell all we should tell about these wonderful things, about our wonderful Savior. The third reason is that the Bible says very little about the devil and a great deal about Christ. Of the devil, Jesus said... And I'm reading John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. He is a liar and the father of it. He was in the truth but didn't abide, didn't stay there. And Jesus came to this world. One of the objects of his coming was to destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 3, 8 but also to destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Hebrews 2.14, so he will be destroyed. Question. Here's another question about the devil. And we might as well put them together while we're on the subject. Is there anything we can do to overcome the satanic power of the devil in this world today? The answer is that there certainly is something we can do. In his very fine book, God Speaks to Modern Man, Arthur Lickey, 
reminds us on page 105 that there are three things we can do to overcome Satan. First, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 12, 11. Our Savior's death on the cross answered all of Satan's power. It made his defeat certain, for the Scripture says that through death he, that is, Jesus, might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, Hebrews 2.14. Second, we can use the most powerful weapon available, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6.17. When our Savior met the temptations of Satan, he said, It is written. Satan came to him three times, and all three times our Savior wielded that mighty sword, saying, It is written. It is written. It is written. Three thrusts of this mighty two-edged sword of the Word of God and Satan left him for a season. Third, we are to keep in mind that we are to resist the devil and he will flee from us. James 4, 7. And we might add a fourth way to oppose him. It's found in Revelation 12, 11. They overcame him by the word of their testimony. We must speak up for Christ and bear our testimony for God. We must be ready with the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit to fight the good fight of faith. And so, lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy 6.12 Question, can you recommend a good home study course in the teachings of the Bible? Well, we certainly can. Just as Orville Iverson, our announcer, has told you, the Voice of Prophecy offers a free faith Bible correspondence course. Just write and say, please enroll me in the Bible course, and the lessons will begin to come to you at once. By the way, they're offered in over 50 languages. And we have a junior Bible course for the boys and girls. Question, do you believe in immortality? Well, it isn't what I believe that's important, but what the Bible teaches. The Holy Scriptures certainly do speak of immortality. It is a gift of God, something that we are to seek for and which is promised to us through Christ. In fact, he brought it to light through the gospel, 2 Timothy 1.10. At the present time, man is mortal. Shall mortal man be more just than God? We read in Job 4.17. God is immortal, 1 Timothy 1.17. In 1 Timothy 6.16, we are told that God only hath immortality. Man must seek it, Romans 2.7. The change from mortality to immortality takes place at the second coming of Christ, when the righteous dead shall be raised, and the righteous living changed. 1 Corinthians 15.52 For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Question, why don't you preach grace? This question must be from someone who doesn't listen to our program often, because we proclaim again and again and again, and hope to continue to proclaim the grace of God is the only hope of a lost and ruined race. As the Apostle tells us in Ephesians 2, verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Some have the strange idea that law and grace are enemies, but they're not. What does the law do for the sinner? First, a knowledge of sin. We read in Romans 3.20, For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And in Romans 7.7, 7, I had not known sin, but by the law. Second, it brings a sense of guilt. Romans 3.19, For we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. When a motorist rushes through the traffic signal, Here's the siren of the traffic officer behind him. His sense of guilt is increased. So when the sinner faces the law for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. A third thing the law does is to act as a spiritual mirror in which the sinner sees himself. James 1.23 Now what is this mirror? Well, it's the law. The Ten Commandments, as you read in verse 25, it quotes some of them. At this law, my friends, the Ten Commandments, of which Abraham Lincoln said nothing short of infinite wisdom could by any possibility have devised it, this law of God makes the gospel necessary. The apostle said he would not have known sin if it had not been for the law, Romans 7, 7. 
And so it drives us to God. We come to Him. And in His grace, His unmerited favor, we find the righteousness of Christ given to those who have sinned. First, the sinner needs forgiveness and justification. The law can't give it. The deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified, Romans 3.20. The law is perfect, but it cannot forgive. The second thing the law cannot do is to make the sinner holy, though it demands holiness. A mirror may reveal a dirty face, but it cannot cleanse it. For God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save it, John 3.17. So if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. This is God's grace, unmerited favor, and with it his power to live from day to day according to his will. So Christ becomes our only hope, but our full and complete and glorious hope. There's enough of God's grace for us today and tomorrow and all the way to the end of the story and into the beautiful city itself. Plenteous grace with thee is found. Grace to pardon all my sin. Let the healing streams abound. Make and keep me pure within. Thou of life the fountain art, freely let me take of thee. Spring thou up within my heart. Rise to all eternity.